to get a bit of a go. Jimmy Somerville watching with us this morning. Disco, more your thing than the Brian Adams. Well, what do you make of uh, Carol's efforts there in Dermot? Look at there. They're it still is. going. They're still I going. I think Carol will probably have a new fan club, old Slinky Hips. <laughs> yeah. Carol has whole got new the moves. For Carol. Yeah, Carol, this is what people don't realise. Carol's got the moves. She's She's expecting a... this with the weather every morning. <laughs> those hips. And Dermot's got what another six and a half hours to go. Yeah. That's a long time. You'll like, you'll appreciate Jimmy, won't you? That is it. Twenty-four hours of dancing. What's the longest you think you've probably done a set on stage of what? Oh, oh. a three-hour set, something like I that. Something like that, a couple of hours. But back in the day, I would go, I would go out clubbing. I would be there for the doors opening, and I would leave for the doors closing, so I would just dance all night. Really? So. For so hours? I've done seven or eight hours. And I always remember going home just completely drenched, but I was absolutely ecstatic. Euphoric. The da ah, dancing makes my, you happy. That was my dream. I used to love it, just on the dance floor. But I suppose combining the dancing with then having to sing as well, now that's really hard work. Yeah, it's OK if you're used to it and if you're, you're fit, young and fit. I don't know if I could quite do it now. <laughs> well, you're looking very well. Now, I think we, we can have a little look back now. Uh, uh, th these are songs that are etched in so many people's memories. Let's have a look. Preparing trousers then, Jimmy. What, those trousers, they were quite distinct to it. They were very, quite high. Quite high and quite pleated, weren't they? Quite baggy. It was, a look, right. it was an 80s look. Yeah, but yeah. that's come around again, hasn't it? It's fashionable all over again. It's really strange when I'm on the street and I'm walking around and seeing all these kids coming towards me dressed in this whole 80s look. I think I went in some kind of time warp. Yeah, oh. the check shirts as well, isn't it? Because small town boy, people remember that song so well. Yeah. And you were wearing a check shirt. Back then, weren't you? And I thought about that when I was coming here. I thought, I can't go on wearing a check shirt and jeans because people were looking thinking, he's still wearing the same jeans. <laughs> no, did you? Really? So I thought I'd scrub up today. No, you look yeah. really, really smart. How, when you're walking about, you say you see all these young people, how recognisable are you to them? Not that recognisable. An older generation, but not younger, because quite. Um, there came a time when I decided I was going to do more in Europe and not be so visible here and not do so much work here and not do so much, kind of, yeah, just not be visible. Because I found it very difficult to, to be on the streets and, and, and deal with the, the kind of recognition, really. So, pop star decides not to be visible. And it's very that, difficult though? with my face, so... <laughs> I mean, so you, <laughs> did, one of these. you did mm. choose, didn't you, to disappear? It, yeah, I did, and I spent. I would do work, and then I would be spending my time. If I was working, I'd go to Europe and still do that. And it kind of it helped, really, to be perfectly honest. I think for a lot of artists, there's that thing that you love the attention, but you hate the attention. So there's this pull and push, pull and push, and it kind of got to me, and it was all a bit too much for me. So well, you're putting yourself in the limelight now because you've got I a new am, album, a new yes. album, and we're going to see some of the new stuff. This is uh, the song "Some Wonder." Straight away, uh, a lot of people are going to be thinking the same thing, which is that your voice remains. That's so distinctive. Yeah. Can you? I'm sure you must have told the story a million times before. How, where did that emerge from, the voice? It really was maybe about a year before Small Town Boy was released. So I didn't really use the singing voice until I was 23, something like that. And how did you find it? Strange enough, I knew Richard Coles, who I'd formed communists with, Richard and I, in the good old days of the GLC, the Greater London Council, which was run by Ken Livingston and so-called loony lefties, yeah. was funding lots of community projects, and one of them was a gay and lesbian documentary film project, and we got involved in that. And Richard had heard me kind of sing and encouraged me to use my voice. Singing in that style? 
Yeah, Is that it's called you counter naturally? tenor. Yes, it's a natural. It's just natural for me to sing. It's a counter tenor, and done a little poem or to a drum machine, and it was like, oh, okay. I knew I had the voice before. I kind of would sing, but because of as a kid, I was having real issues about my sexuality. I thought that it was unmasculine and not very manly, so I was a bit scared of it. So you'd hidden it away? And hidden it away, because I think if I had been at school and went into a choir, I would have been encouraged to use it, because it's, a, it's quite a precious gift, and it's a very rare thing for men to have a countertenor voice. Yeah. You didn't just find, find your voice, though, did you? You found your story and you told it. Yeah, um, from, from Bronski Beat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that was, that was a great thing. So I got together with Larry and Steve, and, because I had no desire as a kid to be in a band or to be famous, it's like I was using that as a vehicle for my politics, my, yeah, for my, for, for my politics, and so I, I was using that as a vehicle. And then when we became famous, it was like, oh, there's no turning back now. <laughs> uh, forgive my ignorance, but you, you, you describe your voice as countertenor. Now, how is that different from something like the, someone like the Gibb, the Gibb brothers, who we think of as singing also with a very high, high voice? What are they compared to you? So that's a falsetto, and technically, I'm not too sure about it. I haven't really investigated that much. I just, I just know I have it. But I can, I can go to the higher range, and I can quite easily bring it down to much lower, like I'm doing now. So I can go, oh, ah, oh, ah, that kind of thing. So I can go wow. back and forth. So it's about the range, which yeah, is so unusual. Range, yeah. um, and listening to the new album, the thing that I noticed very much was it's quite disco, isn't it? Absolutely, and it's my homage to a genre. And in the process of making this, I've actually understood that I'm of a generation now that can look back 30, 35 years to the music that was part of my youth, part of my teenage years, and that kind of influenced what I've been doing through the rest of my life. And that's a kind of, that's quite a new thing, actually, to have such a, a long history of music. You know, so I'm, I'm of a, a generation that that's a new thing for, so. Uh, no, I mean, this is the video from Small Town Boy. And I don't know what you think when you watch that. I mean, I remember watching that thinking that truly was literally almost like a documentary. We were watching your, your story. Of course, it is a video, for, it's a pop video. But I, I thought that really was your life, and I suppose in a way it was. It's groundbreaking because at that time, most of all the other videos were just big productions of flash, bang, wallop. It was like real kind of massive. And this was, this is a narrative, it's a story, it's, it's got a kind of real, it's real, you know, it's very real, the elements to this and everything. And, you know, that's what grass of me, my sister, family. And it's telling a story of my story, but it's also telling a story that was quite universal for a lot of people. What was the relevance of the swimming pool? And that's really about this idea of, it's about sexuality, it's about desire, but it's also about fear and homophobia. And at that time, you know, we were, in the early 80s, there was a real sexual politic explosion, you know, and I, I was part of that, you know, I was part of this, a young man in the, the, politi the sexual politics and lots of politics, really. Yeah, uh, can I just say, Jimmy, you're looking very good, Nick. <laughs> I'm keeping myself pretty <laughs> What's good, What's the secret? Yes. The secret, um, there's a lot of kind of, like, there's a lot of elements to just how I look after myself. And one of them is, like, you know, good food, having a positive outlook, and for me, not drinking. Ah. You said it. And the occasional seven-hour disco dance marathon. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to see you this morning. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. And Jimmy's album is called Homage. A ventriloquist, uh, Nina Conti will be with us in just a moment. First, here's a last quick look at what's happening where you are this morning.